Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to you wherever you are in the world, and welcome to yet another Zoom meeting and podcast of Here's Tom with the Weather, where we investigate the plethora of higher powers that populate the vast universe of recovery, particularly where the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous encourage us to find some kind of higher power as long as it's not us. For example, in the third step of the AA 12-step program, it states, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And also in the 11th step, where it states, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his, sorry, of his will for us and the power to carry that out. We speak to people with all manner of higher powers from those who are atheists, Satanists, Sufis, agnostics, Christians, Buddhists, followers of Islam, hermetics, paganists, and those who follow something called non-duality. We leave no stone unturned. It's our aim to promote understanding and open-mindedness so that alcoholics and addicts can find a higher power of their own to stay sober and carry the message. We promote tolerance and empathy for folks who might have different spiritual practices than us. It's all about live and let live. And please remember that this is not an AA meeting. It's just some people's version of the truth, whatever that may be. Sometimes we speak to seekers, to gurus, and people not necessarily in recovery. And today, it's my honor to introduce you to David Godman. Hello, David. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me. No, it's my pleasure. I'm just going to read a short bio, um, unless you just in case you're not familiar with David. I think a few of us are. But just to give you a bit of a bio that I've nicked off... um, one of the various uh, web- websites about him. David was born in Stoke-on-Trent in 1953 in England, and during his second year at Oxford University, while reading Ramana Maharshi's writings for the first time, he fell into a state of silence, which transformed the way he viewed himself in the world. Finding it impossible to study for exams, he dropped out in his final year and rented a house in rural Ireland, where he read Ramana's books and practiced something called self-inquiry. The following year, in 1976, he went to India, and despite his intention to stay for only six weeks, he's been there almost continuously ever since, residing mainly in Tiruvannamalai, where Ramana Maharshi's ashram is located. From 1978 to 85, he was the ashram's librarian. And it's also worth noting that he's sat in satsang on several occasions with legendary sage Nizagadatta Maharaj. Starting in 1993, he spent four years with none other than Papaji, in Lucknow, where he wrote the book, Nothing Ever Happened. David is married to Miri, who's a philosophy lecturer who teaches in Perth in Australia. He's based in India, but nowadays spends um, a large part of his year with her in Australia. David is the author of six books, 16 books, sorry, rather, um, that include Be As You Are, No Mind, I Am The Self, Papaji Interviews, Living By The Words Of Bhagavan, Saranama Dasanam, and Sarupa Saram. And I hope I got those pronunciations right. David, thanks again for uh, coming along, and it it means a great deal to have you with us today, or this morning, and thanks for getting up so early. So, David, I just wanted to ask, and I read that that bio there of you, and um, for a lot of us in in recovery, the the search for of becoming a seeker is is a necessary part of of getting sober and staying sober. Um, Which is, you're a seeker, it's obviously that there was something in you as a seeker. What what kicked that off? What was your, how did that story start for you? Where did the, the actual... David Godman's seeking story start. How did that happen? I was in my uh, second year at university uh, with an, an increasing interest in all things uh, spiritual, Eastern, esoteric. Um, there's an absolutely outstanding university bookstore there uh, into which I was pouring all my spare funds, buying books, devouring them intellectually. But all, all they ever did for me was make me go back the next week looking for my next fix. Uh, classic addiction, if you like. I, I, I wanted more, 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 and nothing ever satisfied me. Then uh, what, one day I was just standing there in the eastern section, and a book quite literally dropped off the shelf into my hands. It was one of those uh, books, books, bookstores where the person behind on the other side was going along, poking books, pushing them, And one of them must have pushed all the way through and fell fell in front of me. I caught it and I thought, well, that looks interesting. That's my book for the week. So I I took it home and uh, unlike every other book I'd ever read, this one actually shut me up. It didn't activate any ideas. It didn't make me think, wow, this is great. There was something about 
a power being in those words in the in the presentation that somehow made me experience the truth of what those words were actually talking about in the book it just left me with a very deep profound silence and and then it, not say inability an unwillingness to go back and buy another book the next week i just thought yes that's it that's what that's what i needed to know thank you okay and that's that set you on your path now just wanted to Again, I'm just assuming there's quite a few people who do know about Ramana Maharshi, but I was wondering if you might just give us a, a brief bio in terms of how, where he came from and, and how, how he became who we now regard today as a, as a you know, as a, a legend, a, a, leg, a, a sage, a guru. Um, I'll say he's probably one of the most uh, famous, well-respected teachers that India's produced in modern times. Um, he came to that status in a rather odd way. He was just an ordinary 16 year old schoolboy doing his stuff when some, something uh, made him decide he was about to die. He had, a, he had a fear inside him and he just went with the fear. He, he looked at it um, and the fear became so intense he actually thought he was going to die. But instead of panicking or running away, he just looked at it and said to himself, basically what 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 is dying and he was lying down on the floor of his house and he wanted to understand what it was that survived the death of the body if anything he was doing a very deep investigation into what it was that animated him, himself what he thought himself to be and his fundamental question which came to him quite spontaneously was who who is this thing what who or what is this thing inside me, myself that sees other things, which sees a world outside, what is this thing which I'm now afraid is about to die? And in, in that moment of inquiry, his sense of personal identity, his individual self, re retreated back into himself, uh, died definitively and never functioned in him again. Uh, he, he said af after that, there was never a sense of being a person inside a body, he just became what he said was the substratum, a kind of sense of beingness, consciousness that was all pervasive. And that became his uh, locus of identity for the rest of his life. He never ever thought he was a person again. So to all intents and purposes, it was the ego, the ego disappeared. Is that, are we talking about uh, ego death? We're, we're talking ego death. We're, we're talking about this, what, what it is inside yourself that causes you to think I'm a person who lives in a body. He always said that was a fundamental um, error, a kind of piece of malware that gets installed in your body at birth. And you, you go around through life thinking, there's a person in this body who needs to do things, make choices, desires, suffers, and so on. That particular correlating, coordinating mechanism in him stopped functioning and never, never really got going in him again. So I guess the question is, what was left when that ego that sense of self died what was what were we left with what was the what was that physical being walking around there was a physical being walking around but he, he said unlike everybody else who thinks what i am is confined to this body and beyond the uh, the extent of my skin i don't exist he he understood and directly experienced that his true nature was a kind of formless substratum of being consciousness in which his body appeared and in which everybody else's body appeared and in which the whole world manifested. And he didn't make that sense of division between I on the inside and the world outside. He just said, I, I, I became that source, that substratum in which all things appear and disappear. Okay. And, um, so just moving straight along then i just wanted to sort of get to the there's a few questions that we ask every guest that comes on and i just um what's your understanding of that word god what is god to you what does that mean um i, I will answer it indirectly in, in the tradition i come from there's a kind there's a, there's a god who looks after the world the one who you might appeal to pray to um but there's there's also something out of which that sense of God comes to. There's something prior to which 
takes you beyond even the idea of a creator God, a forgiver God, uh, a, a God who uh, make, makes rules and punishes them. All, all that goes back into this substratum and vanishes. In, in this substratum, there's no otherness. There's no God who's apart from you. There's no God in charge of you. There's no, there's no superior being in a way who is in any different, who is in any sense different from what you actually are. Okay. Um, now, in, in AA, a, a large part of, particularly in step one, um, we talk a lot about surrender or we give up. We, we sort of give up the fight and we give up the battle and we let go. It's kind of a letting go process. Can you see a correlation between that and, and something that we, we mentioned before, that thing called self-inquiry? You've mentioned it once already. What's the, what, what, is, what does that mean? What is self-inquiry and surrender? Are those two linked together? Is there, are there, is there a similarity there? Ramana, all his life, he said, there are, there are two ways you can reach this state. One is through what he called self-inquiry, which I will explain shortly. But he also spoke very highly of self-surrender, um, giving up not to any kind of external power or authority, but actually surrendering the notion that you are an individual person inside a body. He said tr true surrender is to give up your sense of self inside yourself to this um, this power, this substratum, which animates everything. Okay. What and I guess the fundamental question as well is that we've we've heard this bandied about a lot is non duality, and you've you've met, you've said things like the substratum and and all that is so non duality is there's not two. I guess that's that's yeah. it. What's what's the What's the difference between the direct path of uh, non-duality and the traditional Advaita? Um, because I know that there's, 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 there's been a little bit of discussion about that. Can you just give us a little bit of an understanding of what the difference is? Or is, is there a difference? I don't know. I, I don't know which other paths you're talking about. Advaita is simply the negative form of the word to. So that means not to. So it, it doesn't have a set of doctrines or ideas or beliefs. It's just a statement that there isn't division, there isn't separation, there isn't a me and a you, there isn't a me and a God. But it doesn't postulate what is, it just says what isn't. It's, it simply says there isn't more than you, there isn't anything separate from you. What, what you are is all there is. Okay. Uh, now, we, we spoke, we mentioned a guy called... Uh, Nizagadatta, and I'm I'm really interested. I think there's probably a lot of people in this in this room that that. So could you tell us a little bit about Nizagadatta, and and is it was he on the similar the same path as as Ramana? Is is he? And you've actually sat with him, as I understand. Yeah, I was with him in the late 1970s. Uh, he was a really great teacher, Com completely and utterly different from Ramana, uh, personality, character. He was feisty, he was a businessman, he sold uh, BDs, those Indian cigarettes. Uh, he had a shop downstairs, he had a mezzanine floor upstairs. He was cranky, feisty, shouted a lot, was very rude. But he had, a, he had a, an awesome power to make you experience the truth of who you are by, shout, by shouting at you in a way, by, by how to, how to explain this? So you would sit in front of him, you'd go to see him, and he wouldn't let you hide at the back. He'd, put, he'd park you down in front of himself, and he'd say, who are you? Where are you from? What do you think? What do you believe? What books have you read? What's your practice? Who's your teacher? Tell me all about yourself. And then as, as you were spreading out your beliefs, you know, like items in a picnic in front of him, spreading everything out, he'd be very a faint interest in what you were saying and encourage you to explain it all. But at the same time, he had a kind of energy, a power. We'd call it a Shakti in India. And he was actually putting you in that state that he himself was permanently in as he was making you um, explain yourself. And a point would be reached where you had two things going on. You, you had all your ideas which you've made, which you've scaffolded together and constructed this nice little edifice out of. And then parallel to that, there'd be a deep fundamental sense of abiding as, as being. He'd actually put you in that state while he was talking to you. 
And you'd think, wait a minute, wait a minute, all of my ideas, they can't possibly be true because they contradict that current, that feeling that he suddenly made me aware of inside myself. So in, in a sense, he'd make you spread out all your ideas, all your intellectual obsessions, all your theories about what the world was and how it worked. And then he'd show you what was real, what was true, and say, okay, you're experiencing something real now, right now. Five minutes ago, you just made this fantasy world and explain what it was, you choose. You tell me what's real, what's true. Either go with your own experience or stick with the, all these ideas you've just been unraveling in front of me. Some people would stick with their ideas and they just put pl pl plow ahead and get more and more complicated ideas out. And other people would just laugh and sit quiet and say, okay, I've got it. That's, that's who I really am. And would like, and similar to Romana, would you consider him to have experienced that ego death? I think he had a teacher that died early on. Um, he was only with him for several months, I think, or a year or something. And uh, the Sagadatta was with his teacher for three years in the 1930s, a man called Siddharameshwar. Um, he, Siddharameshwar passed away before and the Sagadatta got it. Um, but his teacher could see that he was on, on the point of getting it. So he gave him permission to teach uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, I, I think he could see it was about to happen. Okay. And um, I'm also interested, uh, again, in your um, bio there, we spoke about um, uh, some of the, uh, a couple of the other teachers that you've been with. And uh, I think um, you uh, you discussed that um, you, you, you've, you've like say, you've written several books about different teachers. Who was the, the most... Um, who was the guy that sort of most had the biggest impact on you, do you think, out of all the teachers that you've sat with? Well, oddly, the one who had the most impact was the one I never sat with. That, that was Ramana himself. Uh, he, he passed away three years before I was born, mm -hmm. so I never, I never got a chance to meet him. But I, I did meet the generation of people who had sat with him, who had come to him, had experienced... Uh, the awesomeness of his presence, if you like, the, the immense radiation that was coming off him. And they too had got to that state. It's a bit like the candle being lit from the previous candle. So, so when I sat with these people, uh, what I experienced in the next generation's presence was what I read about or had read about in all the books describing what people felt like when they were with him. So I, I would tick off Papaji, who was... Uh, uh, quite famous nowadays. I, mm -hmm. I was with him for four years in Lucknow. Uh, uh, Lakshmana Swami, who uh, got the full experience when he was quite young. He, he's the last of the last of the last. He's uh, he's 95 years old now. He's, he's, in my opinion, probably the only the only one left who's got that direct experience from Ramana. So it's so it is legitimate in your eyes that, like you say, from candle to candle. So I know that there's there's kind of like almost I think third and fourth generation people who've who've had that candle that relay race going. Is that is that still something that can we pass it on from from the next generation to the next generation to the next generation? I think that's the way it works. I, I think you you can accomplish a lot through your own effort through your own practice. But ultimately, you have to come face to face with somebody who has that, who has that power. Um, your sense of individuality has to encounter that power. Uh, and that power, if, if you're ready for that power to destroy you, then that's, in my opinion, the best way of going about it, the most likely way it's going to happen. And except in very rare cases, it's the only place it's going to happen. Mm. We had a, a really great discussion earlier on today or yesterday for you, and we spoke. I, I mentioned something in AA. We've got this thing called Tradition Seven, where you're not obliged to put any any money in the to the pot at the end of the meeting. It's it's the beauty of AA is that it's kind of like this almost an anarchy that seems to work. There's no there's no obligation to pay anything. And we you you told me a great story um, about you know your your own your own experience with that in terms of. Um, you, I think you mentioned that Papa G had told you a story about that with with Ramana and stuff. Would you would you relay that to us? Well, as well? It, it was it was more general. Uh, we were talking about money and teachers in general, and I said all, all of the teachers that I've been with, the best of the best, none of them ever asked anybody for money. 
and all of them made it quite clear that they didn't even want to be associated with the donation program. So pa Papaji tended to be a, a peripatetic teacher. He went around uh, to other countries, other people's territories, and taught by invitation. But his, his rule was, um, I, I will come to your place if you get me a ticket to come, um, accommodate me, and make a space where anybody can come and listen to what I've got to say. But nobody who walks into that room is going to be charged anything. No one is ever going to be made to think that they're required to give a donation. He said, money will not get mentioned at all, otherwise I won't come. So that, that, was, that was the deal. If you wanted him to come, you personally attended to all his expenses, made a public space, and then didn't charge people, didn't have a donation can at the door, and never even hinted to people that donations would be welcome. Mm. That's interesting, just going on there, because I think um, today, I mean, there's a plethora, like absolute with non-duality or any kind of spiritual uh, seeking, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a big business. It's, a, it's certainly a big business to, you know, for anyone, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff to be, that you pay for. And um, I'm interested in, in what your opinion is on how we tell who the, who is the real thing. You know, we talk, do we, do we know if there's another Ramana around or another Nizagidata or whatever, but how do, how do we know who the real, the real deal is? Is there, is there anything to let us know that that's, that's the same? Because there's so, there seems to be so many who claim enlightenment. And I, I find that really, it's fascinating from a, from a, a sociological point of view. Right. Um... Uh, how, sh how shall I say this politely? Fake diamonds exist because they're all trying to pretend that they're the, they're the real thing. The fake diamonds don't invalidate diamonds in general. They, they simply demonstrate that once in a while there's a true, genuine, real one that shines. Um, how, how do you find that one? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question everybody really wants to know, and unfortunately there's no satisfactory answer. Um, for example, Ramana was once asked if, if it was true, I don't know where this question got his information from, but he said, is it true that there are seven enlightened people living in this holy place in South India? And Ramana laughed and said, uh, it may or may not be true, but how will you recognize them? They might be the beggars lying in the ditch. So th th there's, there's something about this state. It doesn't conform to a, a blueprint, a standard. You don't end up looking or behaving in a saintly way. You don't have to sit uh, at the front of a big assembly to dispense your wisdom. You could be anybody. You, you, you could be holding down an ordinary job. You can have this state. You can not tell anybody. As Bhagavan said, you, you, you might be the beggar lying in the ditch. When people asked him, well, how do, how do, how do I get my enlightened radar working? What, what do I look for? What are the blips on the screen? He would say, there's a power that comes off these people, they can't hide it. That if your mind becomes quiet or silent in their presence, then that's a good sign. And he said, also look for the way that they treat all the beings around them. And by beings, he didn't just mean people, he meant you know, the, the, the animals, the trees. If, if they have uh, a false sense of equi not equanimity, um, treating everything equally. If, if they appear that to deal with everybody around them, all the things around them in an egalitarian way, if they have this radiant silence, this power coming off them that makes your mind go quiet, he said those are the two best signs, but he said they're not proofs, they're just strong indicators. It, so long as you have a sense of individual identity, then what you've got is a mask, a covering that you can't say for sure, yes, this person is in this state and that person isn't. So the, the best you can hope for is one or two key symptoms that might give you a strong indication. Okay, yeah, that's that that is that is fascinating, fascinating for I think for all seekers, no matter what your path is, um, is sorting the yeah, like you say, the false diamonds from the real diamonds. Um, I just wanted to ask you again, um, just about non-duality and how do I? It's a question that's come to me: is how do I? fully believe that this life is a dream that i'm here because it's obviously so for me it's so easy to be mesmerized by 
you know, distractions out there. And my ego is very, very keen to always grab onto distractions and stop me from, from looking within. How, how is that? How do we, how do we enable that? How do we sort of reduce that, that tendency? I, I think Ramana would say, I'm not asking you to believe in anything uh, except that you exist. He said that that's the fundamental irrefutable state that everybody has. If you, if you sit in front of him and say, sorry, I don't exist, people would think you're a little bit odd. That the fact yes. that you're there, you, you can't declare your non-existence to anybody because the person who's declaring it is existent. So he, he, he would say, take, take your own sense of existence as proof that you are, proof that you exist. And then the next thing is, who are you, what are you? Find, find out what it is in yourself that's permanent, real, happy, and true about your existence. And what, what are the accretions that somehow you add to it that make you suffer and desire? And he said, learn, learn to separate the wheat from the chaff, if you like, that there's something real and abiding in you. And he said, if you hang on to the real bit of it and discard the unreal bit, then, then you find yourself in a state of per permanent, um, inescapable happiness. And if you grab the wrong bit, you end up suffering. So I, I think he's giving you, in scientific terms, what, I would, what the scientists will call a working hypothesis. He, he's saying, this is my analysis of what I think is currently wrong with you. I'm giving you uh, a method, a practice, by which you can test my hypothesis, go off and test it, come back later after you've done it and we'll discuss it. So it doesn't start with a belief, it starts with your own innate experience of yourself, which he then tells you to look at, study, go into, uh, not saying this is who I am, but sim simply to look at it and see where it goes. Okay, so I've got a, um, a couple of questions now. So if anyone's got a question, you pass it via me, please, and um, and I'll, I'll relay it back to David. So Marty T in uh, California asked the question, how can we help a newcomer to Ramana? <laughs> I don't think, um, I don't think he needs any missionaries out there for him. I, I've been in this world all my life and every morning I open my inbox and there's generally two or three people I've never heard of and they all say, oh, I talked to somebody, I saw his picture, I saw this book and so, some, something grabbed me. I, I think he's got his own, um, how should I say, little, little magnet out there, P people who have an affinity with it. They find someone who knows about it, they pick up a book, they talk to someone, um, something, something inside them says, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this out. And if, if, if they have an interest, if they have an affinity, then somehow they get slowly, slowly pulled into it, they get more and more serious. I don't really think he needs anyone to act as ambassadors, messengers, missionaries on his behalf. I, I think when people are ready, when they have an interest, they find him and things naturally flow from then on. His living presence is, is it's attraction rather than promotion. <laughs> there there right. is a power there. Pe people would go to see him. Um, so he, he, he lived in this very uh, ancient traditional power center in South India called Arunachala. He, he would always say that the power of this place brought me here. If you've come to see me or you've expressed an interest in who I am or what my teachings are, then the same power that brought me to this place is also bringing you to me to this place. Don't, don't personalize it, don't say it's me. If, if you're ready for this, or if this is what you care about, then this power will somehow find you. It's like, it's like a kind of radar. Um, you go bit, bit, bit on that, uh, that power's radar and you get slowly pulled into the center of it. Okay. Thanks very much, Marty. It's great to see you. And um, now David R., um, who's from uh, the West Coast as well, David asks, and this is preempting a question that I was going to ask you, I think it's about your method methodology, but David R. asks, can you describe the mechanics of self-inquiry? 
tracing the source of the I thought. How do we know we're not just tracing a circle back to our own ego I? Okay, time for the, time for the, the long explanation then. Okay, um, go what, for it. <laughs> what Ramana is saying is that your sense of being an individual person, an I inside a body, is utterly dependent on the things that this I associates with or identifies with. So as you sit there listening, you have a bunch of ideas about yourself, which are all predicates of this internal thing that you call I. You think I am a lawyer, or I am a woman, or I am a cancer patient, or I, I am in, in an AA group. So these are the predicates of the subject I. The I is common to all of them. And he said this I is, um, it's almost like a piece of malware inside yourself that installs itself and then takes control of your life by making you believe in its own existence. Uh, it only continues, it gets there by grabbing onto all the things around it. Everything that comes your way, uh, whether it's looking at a tree, eating your dinner, you say, I'm eating dinner, I see the tree. All your feelings, your sights, your thoughts, your perceptions become framed between an internal observer who you call I and all the things, all the objects that it latches onto or identifies with. And the conclusion, if you like, or the unchallenged conclusion is that there's somebody inside you, uh, a little person in there who presses the buttons, pulls the levers, who's somehow continuous, who has to choose, decide, filter all this information and make it available to this internal process or information. What Raman is saying is that's actually all wrong, that your this process of an internal identification with this thing that you called I, it only exists because you're constantly looking out and saying, I am this, I am that, I want this, I want that. <clears throat> he said the internal I cannot exist unless it's trying to find something or grab hold of something. So if you're back to, I, I see a tree, there's a tree out, you think outside of yourself and there's an internal observer of the tree. What Ramana is saying is hold on to this sense of I and don't let it wander off and make any association, any identification. Just be aware of this thing inside yourself that you've never really looked at during your entire life. Just let it be there, this internal sense of I and let it not jump out to say, I see this, I want this, I feel this, I think this. It's very, very hard because that, that's the way the mind, the brain is programmed. It always wants to grab hold of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And what he's saying is that if you can stop that and just be aware of this fundamental sense of I in yourself without allowing it to be involved with anything else, he said you'll suddenly discover that it can't exist by itself in isolation. I think that this is the key if you like, theoretical linchpin of what he's saying. He's saying this sense of being a person has to be always lat latching onto something else to sustain its existence. And mm -hmm. he said, if, if you can keep full attention on this interior, internal sense of I, you'll, you'll find out it's a fiction, it's a creation. When you stop it jumping out to join things, it loses its power to exist it slowly retreats, subsides, and vanishes in the substratum, and then you're home free. You, you've lost your sense of being an individual because you're no longer using this false idea of an individual to reach out and connect to things. Okay, fantastic. I do want to ask you again, I know, I know you spoke about it today, you, you explained your own personal practice, but I thought we might save that towards the back end of today or this morning for you. Um, but Kaiser, who's a, is a regular, is a panelist on here, asked this question. What significant changes have you experienced in your identity? And can you prescribe causes to these changes? Are we all awake but don't know it? Lots of, lots of questions there. Significant changes. Um, you know, where, where I come from, um, people don't say they're happy. They, they have this wonderful indirect formulation that literally means to me there is contentment. And I, I, I just find that as su such a 
you know, fits like a glove description of how, how, I, how I feel, how I live my life. It's not me who's happy. There's just a kind of impersonal underlying deep sense of abiding contentment that per permeates my whole life, my whole, my whole being. So I say, for me, to me, there is contentment. That's, what's, that's what people say in my part of the world. It, it's not caused by anything. It just seems to be there all the time. Uh, I know in AA you talk a lot about uh, surrender, mm -hmm. surrender to the higher power. I think when, when, I, when I was young, I was the, uh, I'm going to do this by myself. I'm going to solve this problem of life. I'm going to meditate all day. Um, I tried, I used to sit all day and meditate. I, I think progressively over the years, I've, I've learned the surrender side as well. I, I've, I've learned to um, trust my teachers. I've learned to have faith in their methods, their practices. I've, I've learned from direct experience the truth of what they're talking about. They, they've shown me, the ones I've sat with one-on-one, -on -one, they've shown me the truth of my own beingness. I trust that state because I've had it for myself. I, I trust the process. I've learned slowly, slowly to let go bit, bit by bit. And what comes out of the other end of the tube, as you like, is a, a, a deep and a, an abiding sense of contentment. That's all I can say. That'll do nicely. Thank you. Um, and just following on from that, so there's an anonymous question. It's sort of just following on from that. Can a person surrender themselves into awakening? Must we do something or does it just happen? No. 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 Uh, I think Ramana would say you, you can't do it by an act of will. Um, people, what people say, I want to surrender, I want to surrender. But th what they can't do is give up the eye that wants to surrender. This, this, this is a kind of difficult problem. So, so what, what Ramana was advocating, I think, is that just pick, pick something in your life that's bothering you, some, something that you've tried to solve, uh, a, a problem that seems intractable, that's bothering you, mm -hmm. and hand it over to whatever you conceive the divine power to be. Um, do it um, almost physically. Uh, don't just have a thought in your head. Uh, put an image, if you like, in front of you, it might be a physical picture, it might be a book, it might be anything, and just say, articulate it clearly. Here is my problem. Uh, I've got this story, I can't deal with it. You deal with it. So don't say solve it, just say, here's the problem, I'm handing it over to you. Uh, you, you deal with it. And of course, two minutes later, you, your head starts filling with thoughts of the same problem again, and my advice to people who do this is when those thoughts come, you address those thoughts and say, you've come to the wrong address. Um, I, get, I just gave you to this higher power, give it any name you like, God, Ramana. Um, you, you just knocked at the wrong door. Five minutes ago, I passed this on to somebody else. You go to him and knock on his door. It's not my problem anymore. So you, you have to make an effort to uh, disown all of these thoughts have faith that the higher power will do something to resolve them. And when the, the bothering thoughts come back, just say, sorry, I, I sold that on to somebody else. Go and see him about it. And what I found, what Raman has said, is that you'll find that doing this solves problems much, much better than you ever can yourself. <laughs> so you, 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 you can look at this um, empirically. You can say, well, I, I used to try and run my life you know, here was my my you know my batting average, if you like. This is how <laughs> successful. This is how successful I was. Uh, some days good, some days bad. But the really, you know, the, the stuff that I was finding hard to do, then I started giving it away to this higher power, and just seemingly miraculously, through no other act than handing it over, these problems just seem to go away or get solved. So you learn by practice, by experience. To hand things over and you find out that this power is a much better more efficient lifestyle manager than you ever were yourself and this gives you the encouragement the faith the belief to hand over bigger and bigger things so it's incremental you, you might hand over some little problem 
that you think is intractable, somehow miraculously it gets solved or goes away. So you think, hey, this is good. I'll, I'll hand over something a little bit bigger next time. And slowly, slowly, you, you manage to turn over a huge chunk of your life. And that's, that's, that's this process of surrender. It's, it's incremental, it's salami-like. You just manage to hand over bigger, big, bigger and bigger chunks of your, your problems, your suffering, because you find out by direct experience that there's a better way of dealing with them. And that better way is handing them over and, and letting, letting the power solve the problem. Don't, don't tell it what to do. Just say, here's a problem, you deal with it, it's not mine anymore. I can't tell you how close that is to to my understanding of AA. That is just phenomenal. So, I think I think that's mind blown. So, that's great. Can, can, can I give you one image? This is straight from Ramana. He said this, this whole idea of I am the doer, I must do things, is completely wrong, and it just causes you suffering. He said, put your put your head load on the on the baggage rack, sit on the chair, enjoy the ride, because you're, you're going to get to the destination anyway. You may as well do it in comfort and not pace up and down in the corridor with the load on your head. So the load is your, all your ideas about yourself, all the things you think you have to do to get to your destination, all the problems you encounter. He said, just learn, learn that the train is on the rails. The rails only go in one direction. You, you're going mm. to get there sooner or later. Sit down, put your feet up and enjoy the ride. So there's no, there's no free will then, basically, what you're saying there, yeah? Uh, what, what he's he's very interesting on this. He, he said that your um, your actions in this life are scripted, but what 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 is not scripted is whether you identify with them, whether you choose to believe that you're the person who is on the train having the ride. He said <laughs> he said he said, he said mo moment to moment, we all have this choice to identify with the person who's got actions to seemingly has actions to perform or to identify with the substratum the the, un, the underpinnings what's what's there all the time he said that freedom is always there freedom is to choose between getting getting involved getting worried getting concerned um, about choices decisions and goals uh, what the body does, it's going to do anyway. Your, your choice is whether, whether you choose to say, I am this person in this body who is undergoing this particular script. So we're sort of like a jockey who thinks they've got the reins on, but we haven't got our hands on anything. We're just along for the ride. Yes. Um, he, okay. he, he, he taught that there is a certain sequence of activities that we all have to undergo in this life. Everybody gets a different script, but he said, who you really are isn't the person who appears to be undergoing the actions. So his, his analogy, which I quite liked, um, was that we're all um, the projected images on a cinema screen. So mm -hmm. the, the, the screen is there all the time. It's there before the movie starts, the movie runs, the movie ends, and the screen's there at the end. So pr projected on that screen are a whole bunch of different characters. We, we think we're character A in the corner, might be the good guy, might be the bad guy. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we root for one little set of flickering images on one corner of the screen. We get very excited when that screen character's up, not so happy when it's down. But he, he said it's all, it's all one. The light on that screen, if you like, is the totality of manifestation. Non, none of it is you. It's all, it's all equal, it's all the same. And it's all supported by the substratum, the screen. He said, who, who you really are is the, the fundamental substratum of your own being. These pictures will appear on it. When they appear, you, th you think you're one of those pictures, one of those images, and you get very excited by rooting for that one particular image against all the other images. He said, that's where you go wrong. Well, appearance is there, well, manifestation is there. It's, it's all one. It's all manifestation of this one essence. So don't get too excited by the ups and downs of one particular character. It, it's all the same power manifesting as appearance. And when the show's over, what remains is the formless screen, and that's who you really are. Okay, thank you. And well, following on from that is um, Murdoch from uh, Nova Scotia um, just said, would it be right to say there is only observing? 
No. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Murdoch. Um, sorry, Murdoch. Um, Ramana tended to distinguish in spiritual practice between things that you put your attention on as objects, that would be the observing. He said that somehow strengthened your sense of duality. It's an act of concentration and abiding as the I, the subject. So he said observing is, is looking at things. It's creating a dichotomy between uh, the seer and the seen. Whereas what Ramana is saying is just be aware of the subject as it is inherently inside yourself without looking at it as an object. Just be aware of it subjectively as I. You'll find out that that I ultimately will subside without being supported by these dichotomized objects. It will go back to its source and then there will be neither subject nor object. Those two can only exist as a pair uh, with each other. When the subject goes, there are no objects either. And so the whole possibility of witnessing observing will end. Observing has to be in a framework of one entity looking at another across time and space. Ramana said that that's also part of your illusion. It's dualistic. Yeah. Okay. So um, a nice little message to you just from Jill, who um, comes to um, some of the uh, Romana stuff that we do. Jill says, thank you so much, David. You were the book that fell into my hands, the candle that led to me to Romana at a time in my life when I was desperate for those teachings. I am forever grateful to you and the work you do. Thanks, Jill. Okay. Can, 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 uh, I, can I stick in one story here? Um, yes, please. I, I have a friend called, I won't even say, say his name, he might be embarrassed, but he, he's a long-time friend. I, I've known him since the 1970s, and he um, had a big picture of Ramana in his room and a post box at the bottom. That This, this is back to surrender. I, I was talking a while ago about how you actually undertake the process of surrendering. So he, he would write messages physically on a piece of paper, very old school, handwritten, and he would fold them up at the end of each day, all, all his stories, all his, all his problems, and he'd put them into this little box. And he said it was almost like flushing them down the toilet, that the fact of writing them out, putting them in this box, would somehow deal with all his issues, all his problems, and he was putting them in under a physical representation of Ramana in his room. And that, that's how he lived his life. He, he lived a very simple, sadduish existence in London. When I went to see him, he'd have a bamboo mat on the floor. That would be <laughs> most, most of his furniture, and uh, apart from his Ramana picture. And he, he worked a minimum amount of work, not because he was lazy, but because he didn't feel he needed money or more than enough money than to feed himself, buy his clothes. So he worked odd job gardening two or three days a week and got by very well. And then when he got to be about uh, 50, uh, just randomly a thought popped into his head. This is a physical occupation. You know, I, I, I won't be able to do this forever. I wonder what will happen when I get old. He had no pension. So this, ordinarily this would be something that uh, would bother a normal person. They'd start thinking about their future, what should they do? And instead of that, he just got out his pen and paper and wrote down, you know, dear Ramana, this, this thought arose in me today. Uh, I've got a physical occupation. I've got no savings, no pension. The thought arose, I wonder what will happen to me when I get old. So he wasn't saying, I've got a problem. He wasn't saying, please help me. He wasn't saying, who's going to look after me when I'm old. He just had this notion of, well, I can't do this forever. I wonder what will happen. So he just he just put it in his post box and forgot all about it. And wheels within wheels within wheels, his mother was visiting an old friend. He used to stay in his mother's house in London. Um, his mother went to see an old friend of hers, an eight year old in Hampstead Heath, a very posh area of London. And this old lady said, oh, I'd like to leave you my house when I die. I've got no one else to leave it to. And his mother, who knew nothing about what her son was doing, said, oh, why, why don't you put it in my son's name? First of all, he's in my house. It would be a good way of getting him out of my house. 
And, and secondly, there won't be du double death duties if it goes from me to him. We, I would give it to him anyway. So why don't you put it in, into his name straight away? And she said, okay. So th this person ended up giving a house to my friend. She'd never even met him. And it was, it was, it was a posh house in the richest part of London. And all, all he'd done to earn it was to look at his Ramana picture, have this thought, what will happen when I get old, write it down, put it in the box. And miraculously, a house dropped into his lap. He, he went up there, he fixed it up after she died. And now, he, now he's got his pension, he's my age. He lives, he lives very happily off the rent from this house. Fantastic, fantastic story. Um, so next question um, is Joseph C. Joseph says, when I is questioned, it lingers for a while, like seen from afar, but then it's quite difficult to describe. It's almost like dreaming. Is that a form of dullness unconsciousness or a result of self-inquiry? The thing about I is it doesn't really exist. It's like hunting for the soap in the bath. You can, it keeps slipping out of your grasp, out, out of your view. I think pe people want to reify it. Is that the right word? They, they want mm. to see it as something solid and real inside themselves. And when they can't find it, they get a bit frustrated. Um, it's not solid. It's not real. It's not there. Um, and that's why you can't find it. Um, what you, can, what you can do is look at this process of how the imaginary I comes into existence. If I, if I say, hold on to the I, look for the I, then your mind, because that's the way it's programmed, reaches out to try and look for something in, in the same way that a searchlight beam goes off to somewhere else and you get a little circle of light focused on something else. That's somehow the hardware inside ourselves, this is how it's programmed to look at things and find things. What Ramana is saying is, no, no, don't ever imagine yourself to be something that you can look at, something you can focus on, because whatever you look at or focus on just becomes the next object. So you end up with an eye looking at what you've imagined to be an eye or you found an eye. And it might be a pleasant state, it might be peace, it might be happiness, but you've somehow made a state because because you've decided i must find this eye this eye will give me happiness you, you've invented this kind of inner realm within yourself in which you've latched onto something you're experiencing it you're getting a bit of silence and peace and you're thinking that must be it you're actually continuing this process of finding an object and looking at it when you do this so so when you start to look to this thing called I inside yourself. It's never ever the thing that you find. It's never ever the thing that your attention latches onto or fixates on. It's the process of the looking. So this thing that's I inside yourself, you, you feel this reaching out to try and find out its own nature, to find out what it is. There's this little, if you like, there's this gap. So instead of becoming aware of something as an object and saying, this is I, this is me. Just watch the whole process of looking, this feeling to discover, the sensation, I must try and find out what it is. And the one who's doing the looking is actually the I that you need to be aware of. Oh. Thank you very much. Cheers for that. That was uh, great. So um, now the guy who actually um, dared me to try and uh, get in touch with you to do this, Michael Stacy from Madeira. Um, who's a, a good friend of mine, whom I've never met, but he's a Zoom buddy, asks, can you please ask David to explain the story of the man who tried to bury his shadow by burying <laughs> in a pit? Um, uh, this, this is just, it's not really a story, it's just an analogy. Um, okay. So, An Anamle Swami, one of Ramana's devotees, used to talk about this also. Um, your mind is, according to Anamale Swami and Ramana as well, it's, it's not a substantial entity that's real. It, 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 it tags around behind you all the time. Um, you, you, can't ta you can't tackle the mind as if it's something real. It's an insubstantial shadow that follows you around. So it, it's the story of a man who wants to get rid of his shadow. So he, he digs a big hole next to himself 
lines up his shadow in the hole and then, then shovels the soil back in again. And of course, the, the, the shadow doesn't go anywhere. It just lays itself across the top of the hole. You don't get rid of the mind by assuming it's real, by fighting it, by coming up with cunning strategies uh, to try and get rid of it. it. It's just a kind of unre unreal ghostly thing that trails along behind you and you, you don't fight it. You don't get rid of it by fighting it. You get rid of its problems by understanding what it is. And it's just an, eph an ephemeral thing that's associated with you that's not going to bother you or trouble you. Okay. Thank you, Mike Stacy from the Madeira crowd. Good to see you, mate. Thanks for asking that. Uh, now, um, Steve Paris, who um, comes to this regular, asks a question. His question is, is the sense of presence, is that the, is that the I thought that we want to abide in? Is awareness the I and the sense of presence the am? I don't think you can distinguish these. In, in English, at least, I is the subject and am is, is the verb of being. Um, I, I think it's all rolled into one. I don't think you can separate. I, I and I am, I, I would say, are essentially the same phenomenon, either in a personal sense or a more absolute sense. Um, for, for example, Ramana would always talk about holding on to the I. Um, Nisargadatta would talk about the I am. Uh, hold on to this sense of I am. It, it will go back into its source. It will reveal who you are to you. It, it's the gateway. It, it's the way back to who you are. In our, in our current state, we attach something to the I. We say, I am David Godman, or I am a person who lives in Australia right now. But the way back to the source is to take out, take out of that what's real, true, and abiding, which is the I, temporarily discard all the things that are aggregating to it, accreting to it, and then just hold on to the fundamental fact of I, I exist right now. And that takes you back to the truth, the reality. You, you, you can call it I when you get there, but I don't think there's anything really you can say that's true about it. But there, there's a nice... Um, analogy that Ramani uses. He said, in, in, in the same way that um, a person's shirt will contain their scent, and if you put somebody's shirt on the ground, a dog can put its nose in it and then follow, follow a scent back to where the person is. R Ramani would say the, the I that you think yourself to be is like the scent. Um, the, there's a lot of extra stuff in there. There's the cloth, um, there's, the, there's the material, there's the form, but somewhere in it, there's a scent of an eye. And if you put your nose into this scent of eye and keep, it, keep your nose to the ground, keep, keep it in there, inside yourself, on this eye, he said, that's the one true, real component of who you are, that the rest is just a kind of set of beliefs, ideas that you attach to it. Keep your nose to this eye, don't get distracted by all the other things this I, the scent of it, will take you back to its source where you'll find out its true owner. This I will disappear there and you'll find out who you really are. Okay. Thanks very much, Steve. It's good to see you again. Um, now, James Lebowski, who's a, a regular panelist as well, asked this question. He thinks you might have already answered it, but it is a good question, actually. So, and this is pertinent for people in AA who do struggle for to find out. There's a lot of people that do struggle for, for various reasons who struggle to find a higher power. Um, but he asks, what if you do not have a reverence for Raman or any particular guru, and maybe even you do not have a clear sense of a higher power? Can you still practice self-inquiry and surrender um, as you suggest to to be of benefit? Do you need to have a have that higher power for this process, do you think? Not, not at all. Um... Start from start from where you are. This this is the basic uh, premise. Ramana says, um, "You think you're a person inside the body. I'm telling you, you're not. I'm I'm giving you, if you like, the key the key to the exit door. I'm I'm saying that this this is where you go wrong. This is why you suffer. You attach things to this sense of I, which are simply burdens. These are the head loads you put on your head." I'm telling you, just find out what is this thing inside yourself that you call I, that you add things to, um, which cause you to suffer in the world. Don't think about anything else for a while. Just look at this I and see what it is and see where it goes. 
you don't have to believe anything except that you exist. That no one can really refute that. He said mm -hmm. that's the only thing you need to believe in. Just hold on to that sense of being an individual self confined to a body. Watch it. Don't let it distract you with ideas, beliefs, judgments. Uh, just hold on to the core essence I and see where it takes you. No, no belief needed, no surrender needed. But if after some time those things start to grow in you, great, then they'll help you. So anyone, even if you're an atheist or you're an agnostic, this is a process that that's, that could help anyone, basically. Definitely. All, okay. all, all, all you need to do is um, say, okay, this is an interesting idea. This man seems to have spent his whole life in, in, in a state of ma magnificent peacefulness, if you like. What's his, what's his magic trick? What was his method? Um, I'll take it as a working hypothesis for myself that what he says happens to be true. I'll test it out for myself. If it doesn't work, I'll go to plan B. I'll go somewhere else. Okay. Thanks very much, James. That was that was the best question you've asked, mate. That was a wonderful one. Thank you very much. <laughs> he knows what I mean. Um, this is a good question. Again, this is something that I do want to sort of if you've got time later on, as we come to the end, um, for you to describe your own practice and how you go about it, because I found that fascinating in our, our earlier talk uh, yesterday. Um, but Sonny asked a great question. Sonny is another regular who comes to our Ramana stuff as well. And he asked is, do you still do self-inquiry or is there no need for it now? I, I still do it because there is a need for it. There is still... Um, somebody who thinks he, he's David Goldman who lives in this body that you see on the chair. Um, it, it's, it's a gradual wearing away, so far as I'm concerned. So somebody like Ramana got it, doing it once, doing it right when he was 16. I, I think he was ready for it. I, uh, I, I, I've sat with and written, written books about other people who got it a lot quicker than I did. I think they had a long period of preparation I think I'm still in the preparation mode. What, what I have discovered for myself is that I, I, have, I have been with some of the most uh, magnificent beings of the 20th century, if, if I may be prejudiced in saying that. <laughs> I, I've, I've sat with them, they've looked at me, and in that presence, under their gaze, if you like, I've, rec I've recognized myself for what I really am nobody can ever convince me otherwise so for me that presence that experience that i got by being with these people has validated the approach for me so i i, I now recognize this this is my best way home this is what's going to work for me i i found out from them what that truth that experience is they've all without exception given given me this get out of jail free card option they've told me if you carry on with this then fi finally one day you'll be there all the time I i've learned to have faith in their judgment because of the the state the presence the experience i've had by being with them so i, I trust them and i keep up with the practice because i know what one day ultimately there'll be a definitive end to my sense of i that's uh thank you very much that's that's very humble um and before we go on, I've got a question from Mallory. Um, we, we, we spoke before about Nizigadatta, who's, who's somebody that, that's quite a fascinating character for me and has been for, for quite a few years. And I guess my question is about this whole, I guess, stereotype of enlightenment um, and that it's sort of like this holy man who walks around being very holy and humble and stuff. And and I, from the we had, a again, that conversation we had earlier, that's not necessarily the case, is it? I mean... You know, we, we spoke about Jesus going into the temple and throwing over all the money lender stuff and all that stuff. The, the, the people that you've met that you would describe as being enlightened, they're not, they're not exactly saints, are they? No. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, well, Ra the one person I didn't meet was Ramana, and mm. he was such a paragon of virtue. I think a lot of people decided, well, that's what you must be if you're in that state. But I think that was an accident, a coincidence, if you like. Um, he, he was an almost St. Francis-like figure. He, he was kind, you know, he could talk to the animals. Um, 
he, he just seemed to exude uh, benevolence in everything he did. But I don't think that's, that's not the blueprint. I, I sat with others, um, family people, ran their business, got cranky, um, but that they all share this absolute knowledge of who they are and what they aren't. And somehow, once you've got that knowledge, once you've got that state, if you, if you sit with these people, if you listen to them, if you take their advice, some, somehow you start to partake, share of that presence that they've discovered in themselves, but they're not in any way pretending, they're not putting on an air. I, I, I think what, one thing you have to understand is, um, I have to say, they're not rational beings. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this in a pejorative way. I, I think if you, if you have a mind, if you have a, this is who I am, um, then you interact with other minds around you. Uh, you, you you're, in a, you're in a jostling throng of, of minds all rubbing up against each other, all interacting, all, all trying to put on a good show, all, all, all trying to go, go with the flow in this great sea of minds. If you don't have a mind, which these people don't seem to have, then they can seem to be a little bit crazy. They, they don't seem to have the same motivations, the same way of deciding what to do next that we do. And that this, this is what they, they say, this is the difference between their state and your state. That there's a lovely phrase in I Am That, Nisargadatta's book. Somebody said, mm -hmm. what's the difference between you and me? And he said, you, you fill your head with thoughts and then you organize fights between them. I don't, that's the only <laughs> difference between us. I, I, I think this, this is a, a lovely succinct expression of why we, why we are who we are, why we think we are who we are and why we suffer. These, these people don't have this whole process of thinking, choosing, deciding, I must do this, I have to do this, I am this. There's no sense of contraction through any thought or belief. And when you're in that state, there's nothing inside you that says, I must behave in this particular way. I must do this to achieve this particular goal. So you, you do have the whole spectrum of true oddity in this state because they're simply not functioning the way that we do. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, so Mallory asked, and I guess I think we've kind of answered this, but she asked um, in Ontario, what would you recommend to do to get closer to the eye? You can't get closer to the eye. I mean, that, that the whole question premises that you're somewhere else apart from it. Re recognize that this thing called I is yourself. Don't, don't create an extra layer that you have to break through to go back to it. Um, it's like taking yourself to be the image in the mirror. That there's nothing, there's nothing more immediate than who you are right now inside yourself. If, if my bladder is full, I say, I want to go to the bathroom. That I is something inside me that's got certain stimuli, certain perceptions. That's, that's where you start with. It's not something different, separate, that you go some way to reach or find. It, it's who you are right now. Just, just look at it, see how it rises, see how it functions. Stop it connecting with peripheral things that are creating a fog around you. Find out its essence and go back to that. Okay, thank you very much, Mallory. It's uh, great to have you along. And just finally, David, we again, if you wouldn't mind, would you could you take us through your um, practice of self inquiry? I know that there's quite a lot of people who'd be really interested to find out what how you go about it, and just give us an example of a, like a, a typical self inquiry for David Godman. I I still do sitting formal meditation uh, because I enjoy it because it seems to work. It makes me very peaceful. It uh, um, energizes me, if you like. So I sit, I close my eyes, and I, I recognize a framing mechanism inside myself that there's stuff going on that I'm registering. It might be a thought, a feeling, an idea, and there's somebody to whom that thought, feeling, idea is presenting itself. So immediately there's a frame of I, David, I'm inside this body, 
a thought about coffee or what I have to do today has arisen. There's a recognition that there are objects and there's a subject who's registering them. So I withdraw attention from whatever the objects are and I try to put it back on this sense of being a person, this sense of personal identity, an identity that isn't um, defined or brought into being by the things it wants to associate with. And I keep doing this again and again. It's, it's a process in which you don't suppress anything. You, you try not to let thoughts run away with you. Um, what, what comes up in front of you when you meditate, whether it's inquiry or not, is the stuff that the mind knows is most uh, interesting. It's going to excite you the most. It has the most emotional charge, if you like. It, I, I, nowadays, I see it like the, like the sidebar in YouTube. Your, your, your mind has an algorithm and the, the movies it puts in front of you are the ones that it knows you've got the most excited by. So it dangles them in front of you again and says, press start button, let's play that movie right now. So, so you see all these things, they come up in your consciousness and because they have a, this is exciting, I've run down this path before, they've got a bit of a charge and you start running off with them. And then you have to catch yourself and you have to say no, I'm not going that route today. No, I'm not getting involved in that. And you just, again and again, you say, sorry, no, I withdraw from that. I withdraw from that. Because you know that going down that route gets, gets you involved in the world, in suffering, in identification, in a whole range of processes that aggregate together to make you an individual person who suffers in this world. So thought by thought, you note that there's an object that you're clinging to, attaching to, trying to run with. And you just say, sorry, no, not today. That's not me. I'm not going to play with you today. I'm going back to this, this fundamental sense of I. So another analogy that I quite like that I tell people nowadays, it's like you, you're, sit, you're sitting comfortably in a chair in your room. You, you've got a window uh, and you've got a door. And you, you see a traveling salesman walk past your window and you absolutely know he's coming to sell you, sell you some junk that you don't want, yeah. don't need, he's going to waste your time trying to sell it to you. Then, then you hear the knock, knock, knock on the door. Don't go there. You don't have to go to the door. You don't have to engage with this person. You, you just know that whatever he's got in his bag, he's holding in his arms, is something either you can't afford, don't want, don't need, or is going to cause you trouble down the line. So you just have to learn to keep saying no to all these things that your mind is presenting to you because the sole reason it presents these things to you is to get you in a train of thought that's just going to put you back in desire and suffering again. So you, you have to learn a certain, um, no, I'm not going there, no, I'm not interested in that, and keep going back to this fundamental abiding sense of I inside yourself and a, a point is reached when, as you start to abide in this sense of I more and more, you, you start to feel pleasantly happy, pleasantly contented. And it, it, it's, it's a bit like a seesaw. Um, there's a fulcrum. You've got all the things that formerly used to make you run out into the world to enjoy um, the, the, the desires you want to fulfill, the things that you had an aversion to, or all the things that would make you rush out and experience, you suddenly start doing your mental accounting, if you were. You start abiding as that eye, you watch it subside, you get to the peaceful, happy states of watching it subside. And if you're lucky, you come to a point where you think, well, I'm, I'm better off in here. I'm, I'm better off in this sense of subsided I, my, my sense of beingness, my sense of presence is quite self-sufficient in itself. I don't need to go out to have a prolonged fight and struggle in the world. That's just uh, a distraction that's taking me away from the peace and the presence of who I am. There's, there's a very lovely analogy that Ramana gave of, again, it's a rural Indian analogy of an angry bull inside a stable. Mm -hmm. So the, the bull will run out, start trampling other people's fields because it doesn't recognize field boundaries. People will throw rocks at it, beat it with sticks. 
and that just makes it angry. Ram said that this, this is this is your mind. It, it's not content to be in its stable. It's just programmed to go out, grab whatever it can, and it suffers along the way because it doesn't recognize the rules of the world. It doesn't know where it can go, where it can't. It doesn't know that other people have property and you're not supposed to eat it. So he said there's two ways to deal with this. He said that the yogic way, if you like, is suppression. You, you tie the bull up in the stable, or if it goes out, you beat it with a stick and make it go home. He said that doesn't solve the inherent tendency of the bull to go out and make mischief and cause trouble. So he said, go out with a big bundle of grass. When, when your bull has escaped, it's only going out to eat food. It, it's, it wants something to eat. Go mm. out with a nice bunch of tasty grass, hold it under the nose, and very, very, very slowly take it back into the stable, and make it sit down. Inside the stable, there's piles and piles of grass. It won't stay there, of course. A few minutes later, it will just walk out through the door. So Raman is saying, don't ever close the door on that stable. Let it go out if it wants to. Every time it goes out, take your bundle of grass out, hold it under the nose, and very, very slowly bring it back and make it sit back in the stable. And he said, even the, the dimmest, stupidest ball at some point will recognize that going outside just results in stone throwing and stick beating. It's going out to get stuff of which there's an infinite supply in store at home. It may as well stay where it is and sit down and munch the grass at home. So that this bundle of grass, if you like, is this sense of I, this sense of being an individual person in the body. So each time you see your thought go out and connect, the thing that takes you home, the bundle of grass, is this sense of I and this brief feeling of happiness that you get by associating with this I. You coax it back to its source, <clears throat> you sit it down, there's an infinite supply of that piece back home. And slowly, 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 you learn, it learns that the safest, happiest, most peaceful place to be is back, is back home and not wandering around with whatever the mind wants to entertain you with. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. That was amazing. So final question. This is what we ask all our guests, and it's um, just a, a little bit of fun. It's a bit of a Radio 4 uh, Desert Island disc question. So Miri has won the uh, Western Australian Lotto. She's a fabulous millionaire, and she decides that you and her have going to buy a super, a super yacht and sail around the world, and you set off on your voyage. You've got all your books, all your, your favourite articles in, the, in this super yacht, and somewhere off the coast of Fiji, you run aground, and the boat rapidly starts to sink. All you've got time is to get a plastic bag and your favourite book from the bookcase, chuck it in the bag, and you and her dive overboard and swim to the nearest deserted island to await rescue. What's the book? Who's it by, and why? Oh, no, this is this is horribly narcissistic. It's one of mine. <laughs> um, um, there's a book I spent years and years compiling about ten to fifteen years ago called Guru Vachika Kovai. It contains the most accurate, the most reliable record of Ramana's written teachings. It was written down by. Uh, a devotee who was probably enlightened at the time himself, R R Ramana corrected it. Uh, it went through a printing process. He corrected the proofs, he, re he rewrote it. And mm. at, the, at the end of the process, he, he amended an introduction at the beginning of the book and put in a line, put in a little syllable that made the sentence read, this book alone contains Sri Ramana's teachings in a pristine form. And the, the reason, apart from the fact it's accurate, reliable, I, I have an absolute conviction that the words of somebody who's in that state have the power to show that state to you. Not because they're true or because they're convincing, but because there's an inherent power in those words that comes from the source that that person is uttering from. Um, so when, when somebody of... Sri Ramana's statue, when somebody in his state says, you are the nature of consciousness, he isn't giving you another fact to file away in your storage area. He's revealing the truth or trying to reveal the truth to you of who you really are. If you can listen to those words, if you can hear them, if you can read them with a quiet, silent mind, 
then you yourself become the truth of those words. You, you yourself find yourself abiding as the source, as consciousness. So if I, if I was going to be marooned on a desert island with one book, I would take a book that was had, has the imprimatur of somebody who's in that state, um, who is constantly in that book saying, this is who you are, this is who you are, this is who you are. And I, I would hope to listen to it, listen to those words, read them with a silent mind, and that those words would ultimately have the power to show that state to me. Uh, many, many years ago, I talked to Nisargadatta, and I said, uh, I read your book, I Am That. Uh, I felt a great attraction to you. Uh, I came here on account of that book. Um, there's obviously a power in those words. They brought me here. Um, how, how long is that power going to stay? Uh, if, some, if somebody finds a crumbly, dusty copy of that book in a thousand, ten thousand years time, will those, power, will, the, will those words still have their power? Will they still work? And he said, of course they will. The, the self is not bound by time and space. There's no, there's no limit to the power of those words. They, they can't be something that decays over time because from my perspective, time is not real, time doesn't exist. If, if somebody is ready to hear the words of truth from someone who has experienced that truth, they can pick up a book in 10 years, 10,000 years time, and those words will do their work. So, so that, that is why when I get marooned on my desert island, I'm going to have a book uh, in my plastic bag of words of power by the person I respect most in this world, the person who has absolutely convinced me they were in that state and whose words have the power to put me into that state as well. Thank you very much. That's uh, That's been awesome. And I uh, just wanted to say to everyone that uh, David's details of his website and where you can get his books are in the chat there. Um, so I think uh, Anne's put it in there. Um, and also the name of um, a couple of his books are in there. So we put everything in there. So yeah, so please, um, please go along. If you've found anything of interest there, um, just to pop along to his website. And David, um, as the sun's coming up behind you, um, I really want to thank you so much for uh, getting up so so early in the morning and uh, to help us here. Because for me, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but it's been just a fantastic experience to hear you and to hear you, your wisdom and to hear you, you speak. So um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone. And just to let everyone know that next week, we've got Paul Hederman on, who's another non-duality guy, and he'll be on uh, next Friday. Um, so, but thank you very much. But in the meantime, I'm just going to stop recording now, but uh, thank you very much, uh, David, once again. Thank you, everyone, for listening, for the questions. I've enjoyed it.